This is the Romans 14 study, Feasts and Fasts and Food, Oh My, and we've been working our way down through this study. And uh, uh, as you can see from the introduction, introduction, the scope and style of the study, we already made our way through bullet point number one, who are the weak in faith. We're now ready to start this week on what is the contrast between anything and vegetables. So let's just turn to that. Give me a moment. Let me close that first tab. I don't need that open anymore. That first window. All right. So let's turn down, uh, scroll down into the commentary, and you'll see that there's a, a, a listing of the verses that we're going to be reading, and we'll probably read some more Greek again. Give me a moment. Let me work our way down through it. Do it here. Okay, so now we're finally beginning a new section. What is the contrast between anything and vegetables? Recall, just briefly, I'll take like 30 seconds to a minute to explain this. The context of my understanding of this passage in Romans, this part of our Paul's letter, is that he's referring to two groups of people. He probably wouldn't have referred to them directly to their face, but they are, who they are is so well known that when he wrote the letter, that the people reading the letter would have understood their respective roles. The strong, which he refers to by name in chapter 15, verse 1, and he includes himself among that group, the strong are likely, and most, in my opinion, most with, without question, Believers in Jesus, both Jew and Gentile, they have made a confession of faith in Messiah, and they are living their lives in accordance with the theology um, that centers around Messiah Yeshua as their salvation, and they are not they, they don't have any hang ups on being saved by works or anything like that. Many of them are also uh, in in favor of keeping Torah. So this is, includes the strong because Paul himself is a Torah keeper. So many of the Gentiles also were in, in favor of, of Torah respectful lifestyle and in favor of, of recognizing their inclusion within Israel. So that would be the strong. They are believers. They are brothers uh, in Christ. Uh, they are the strong. The weak, in my understanding of this passage, by comparison, are those Jewish people who were comprising the larger community of faith that Paul came from, right? His fellow brother Israelites, fellow covenant members within the Abrahamic covenants, fellow uh, uh, members of Israel from a national perspective, so national Israelites. However, um, because of their um, lack of, of fully understanding who Messiah Jesus was within the overarching scope of salvation history, they had not yet evoke, made a vocal profession of faith in Jesus. They weren't hostile to the idea that Jesus was the Messiah. They just weren't um, publicly confessing that he was Messiah. They were deliberating. So thus, Paul calls their faith weak in the sense that they have not yet made a confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ. They were strong in their faith in God, and they were strong in their loyalty to Torah, and thus they allowed Gentiles into the group uh, because of the strong monotheistic claims of God as the one true God. So they were willing to worship with Christians, both Jew and Gentile, as they had dialogue, open dialogue on these matters. But that's who I believe the strong and the weak are. And this is the context that we find this chapter in. So now as we move down into this chapter, we begin to ask some very valuable questions as to why Paul put this letter together and what its relevance is for us as 21st, Christian, 21st century Christians. Indeed, a better way to work our way through the passage is to first begin to ascertain who the players were, who the writer was, what's the social setting occasioning the letter, why it was important to them first, and then after we feel we've got a, a handle on that, then we can launch into a 21st century modern application of, of the message of the, the chapter. And so that's why we took all the lengthy months, I think it feels like months, it may have only been a few months, to go through establishing the background behind the letter, the readers, and the social setting. So now we've got, we know we've got Jew and Gentile thrust together in a social setting where they're going to have to work out their differences when it comes to uh, uh, interpretations of certain parts of the Bible. And so now Paul brings in this discussion. Let's read the passages. We've got uh, three verses here. Um, verse 2 in the ESV says, One person believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. The Greek, again, over on the right side, says, Hasmen pistue phagin pantaha de astenon lakanta estia. Notice in the Greek, he talks about the weak person, the estheon. 
uh, I'm sorry, the Ostenon. This is likely related to the, um, if we go back to Romans 14, verse 1, we, where in English it says, the weak in faith, uh, the Greek right here would be um, Ostenunta te piste. We can see that likely Paul uses the same Greek term, although he leaves off the word faith. The word faith is the word piste right here. Uh, but the word weak or feeble or unable is the Ostenunta. Down here in verse 2, he has a similar term terminology, Austin, sorry, let me try and highlight, there we go, the similar terminology, Austinone, uh, which is probably related back to the weak in faith up here. Thus, verse 2 could be essentially a gloss. One person believes he may eat anything while the weak in faith person, even though he doesn't say Austinone to tapiste, the, he simply says the Austinone. The weak person, the Aust, the weak one, um, La Canta Vegetables, SDA eats. So that's our first uh, thing that we should notice. It's likely that the same context, the weak person of verse 2, is the weak in faith person, which I believe are the unbelieving Jews, in verse 1. He continues in verse 3, let not the one who dis eats despise the one who abstains, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. In the English, it says, let, the, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains out of the ESV. But literally, it's in the Greek, let not the one who eats and the one who does not eat. As we see over here in the Greek, ha estion ton me estionta me estion exutineto, ha de me estion ton estionta me crineto, ha theos garer auton praselabato. So literally, let me turn to this version here for a second. Literally in uh, Greek, in fact, let me turn to this version. You can see this a little better. Uh, in verse 3, uh, the one eating, estion in the Greek, and the one not eating, ton me estianta. So you can see that estion here and estianta here are rooted in the same Greek word, Strong's number 2068. So it's just that we have this word may here, this adverb that uh, tells us uh, the reverse. So the one eating and the one not eating. And these are the ones that Paul says, may exothenato, don't despise these. So uh, the one now not eating, may estion, estion uh, and the ton estianta. So again, 2068, 2068. So that, I, I bring that up to say that in the English, uh, we simply have the word abstaining. But literally, it's the word, it's the one who's not eating. So this helps us to gain the context um, a little bit more sharply. Is it the one who's simply abstaining from a type of food, or is he simply not eating the contextual food altogether? And, of course, Paul says that neither group should judge or pass judgment on each other because God has welcomed him. This is an interesting word, this um, welcome, uh, prosalabato, as we uh, turn over here to this word. Uh, uh, prosalabato uh, could be more properly translated, God has received or received or uh, welcomed unto himself. It gets translated in English as welcomed, but uh, literate received. And then verse 4 here in the English says, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? He uses the same word up here, uh, judgment here, same word down here, uh, krinon in the Greek here, um, is uh, same here, krineto over here, krino here, krineto, same Greek word. Um, who are you to pass judgment on the servant other is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld for the Lord, right, the kurios in the Greek, the Lord is able to make him stand. In the Greek uh, of verse 4 over here, says, Sutis e hokrinon alatrion oikatain to idio kurio steke e pipte sta thesidai de dunate gar hokurias stesai autan. Literally, uh, the Lord right there. So, this is the passage that we're going to be looking at tonight. I'm not going to spend too much time discussing um, all the technical Greek. What I want to do instead for us tonight is I want to borrow a commentary um, by a group known as um, Verse by Verse Ministries. And this is available online at www.versebyverseministry.com. Dot org. And in my opinion, it's a very well put together com uh, w a website that, that captures the, the essential Christian perspective on any different passage or any different Bible topic such as Trinity or Christology or Ecclesiology or things like that. Um, unfortunately, from my perspective as a Torah teacher, it, it captures also the 
traditional Christian perspective on should the Torah be practiced by your average Christ, Gentile Christian, their, their answer to that question being no. The Torah has been done away with in their perspective. It's been set aside, relaxed by, by Moses, I'm sorry, relaxed by Paul, fulfilled by Jesus, so that we as Gentile Christians no longer have to concern ourselves with keeping the Torah. So that is the perspective. I'm trying to give, tell you that right up front as a Messianic. So I disagree with that perspective. But in order to capture the prevailing Christian understanding of these these short three verses, 2, 3, and 4, Romans chapter 14, I'm going to borrow their commentary and read down through some of what they have to say so that we can see it. So what, if you see here on Romans, they've got a, a, a study on Romans. If you scroll down, there's audio, and then they've got, uh, uh, you can read down, and we're going to scroll all the way down to chapter 14 and read this part right here. If I click on read, this is the page that I'm going to come to. So I've already loaded the page in my browser. And they've got some nice little chart here that talks about uh, righteousness and priority of sanctification. We'll scroll past all of that. I want to jump right into um, uh, uh, their uh, background behind the passage, and I'm going to just just do a lot of reading. Okay, so let's start a reading and do it for their uh, commentary. Let's start it right there in their bullet point. And I'm going to easily read down through probably three or four pages. So just sit tight and let me read down through this without commenting a lot. It's self-explanatory. This is the essentially the standard Christian position on the issue of that I raised the question, what is the contrast between anything and vegetables? And what do we make of one person believes he may eat anything while the work weak person eats vegetables, things like that. We're going to go down through this from a traditional Christian perspective, and that will cover all of tonight's study. We'll dead end with the Christian perspective, and next week we'll take these same three verses and we'll look at the Messianic perspective, which is my own perspective on these three passages, but like I typically do, I will present the Christian position first, which is the, the perspective that is familiar to most of you within church circles. So sit back and listen, let me read. Per courtesy of versebyverseministry.org, the formation of the church during the first century involved a grand social experiment. Never before had Jews and Gentiles tried to associate so closely together. The amalgamation of these two groups into one body brought significant challenges, and we get a sense of how great these challenges were when we read about the experiences of the apostles. They go on to say, in particular, the apostle Peter struggled with the introduction of Gentiles into the body. They continue, um... At one point, his struggles even threatened to divide the body of Christ. It required another apostle, Paul, chastising Peter publicly for his failure to embrace God's call to the Gentiles to advance the unity of the church. Notice they're talking about the challenges of the first century, which I agree with, of Jews and Gentiles suddenly being thrust together as one entity, which again, I agree with. We're not talking about erasing the distinctives between Jews and Gentiles. We're talking about um, how do we reconcile the differences between our cultures and our theology as two people groups without compromising on what God's word is truly giving to us. And so then this particular website uh, ministry uh, relates the incident in Galatians chapter 2 where Paul rebukes Peter and things like that. We're not, I don't have to read all that. Um, let me jump, skip past uh, some of that and jump back into the Romans 14 uh, study itself. Picking up their reading here. When Jews from the Jerusalem church visited Antioch, Peter refused to eat with them. I'm sorry, uh, that's still uh, Gentile, uh, Galatians. Um, all right, let's pick up uh, the reading right there. They have to say, clearly if the Apostle Peter struggled to accept Gentile believers, we can be sure many other Jewish believers had the same trouble. So now we're back in the context of Paul addressing Jews and Gentiles together in this letter to Romans. And Paul is recognizing that there are those who practice Jewish observances, the, the weak, and those who don't practice Jewish, a Jewish lifestyle, Torah-based lifestyle, uh, many of the strong, although not all of them, but some of them, and many of them perhaps. And this website goes on to say, as hard as it was for Jews to accept Gentiles, the opposite was also uh, true, right? Gentiles and Jews accepting one another. Gentile believers were equally put off by the oddities of Jewish culture. Jews were raised to, obstruct, to observe strict dietary restrictions and to practice unique rituals of daily life. They go on to say, when a Jew came to faith in Christ, he or she was suddenly free from these restrictions and could live life 
in new and unfamiliar ways. Now, notice this uh, bullet point right here. I disagree with their assessment. I don't believe that when a Jew, well, I, let me say it this way. A Jew could, if he wanted to, abandon his lifestyle as a Torah-keeping Jew in favor of a predominantly what we might express as a Gentile free, a freedom in, as a Gentile, like the Gentiles, to, to not follow after Torah. But um, I disagree with the theological uh, statement that they're making here that the Jews were suddenly free from those restrictions as if they were some sort of bondage. I don't think that's the way Paul would describe uh, the Torah lifestyle. Let's keep reading uh, right there. Nevertheless, many Jews found it extremely difficult to abandon their Jewish heritage and lifestyle practices. Well, of course, why not? Because the Torah never tells us to abandon. In fact, it's quite the opposite. The Torah actually enjoins we Israelites to continue holding fast to Torah observance and loyalty to God's ways as lifelong Jews, as lifelong Israelites, as lifelong covenant members, uh, even after we come to faith in Messiah. So that's why I disagree with their theology. But let's keep reading. So many first century Jewish believers, con so many first century Jewish believers continued in their Jewish traditions. This is true. You read through the book of Acts. There were myriads, thousands who were faithful, who believed in Jesus and were um, loyal to uh, the Torah of Moses. They go on to say that the letter of Hebrews was written to stop the most extreme of these behaviors among Jewish believers. But these practices were both unfamiliar and unappealing to Gentile believers. That's understandable. Jewish zealousness made Gentiles uncomfortable, especially if combined with self-righteousness or haughtiness. So, uh, so Gentile believers resisted integrating with Jewish believers who maintained their Jewish traditions. A key sticking point for unity in the body was Jewish insistence of never sharing a meal with Gentile. Now this is important. Let me read that uh, uh, point one more time right here. A key sticking point for unity in the body in the first century was Jewish insistence of never sharing a meal with a Gentile. This actually gives us a very valuable socio-religious insight into the first century struggles between Jews and Gentiles. Particularly from the Jewish perspective, from their vantage point, Gentiles were suspect of being idolaters. And we're going to read about this in a moment. And so therefore, Jewish uh, authorities in Paul's day had uh, created all kinds of extra laws and restrictions behind associating with Gentiles uh, in marketplaces and in their homes and and particularly, especially, uh, holding table fellowship with Gentiles. And so, because what we're going to find out in Romans chapter 14 is that one of the primary issues that Paul is bringing to the table, pun intended, is table fellowship itself, which may be not so important in our 21st, mind, 21st century mindset, but in the first century mindset, table fellowship was an indicator of shared covenant status or shared covenant membership or shared theological perspectives. You didn't just have table fellowship with any old stranger if you were a Jew. Back in Paul's day, table fellowship bespoke of a shared um, uh, uh, covenant uh, agreement between the party that you're uh, eating a meal with. So uh, table fellowship and table uh, uh, manners and all of that type of stuff, eating a meal together with a person, uh, indicated more than just having friends over for pizza. So that, we have to move past our 21st century understanding of eating with people and go back into the, 20, into the first century understanding. And here's what verse-by-verse um, uh, -verse ministry brings out. The requirement stemmed from Jewish dietary restrictions. Of course, that's rooted in the Torah, right? Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter uh, 14. So... Uh, since a Jew could not eat many things that Gentiles commonly ate, Jews avoided Gentile tables. And that was just common sense. This quickly turned into a prohibition against entering a Gentile house or association with Gentiles whatsoever. They continue. This was the same rule Peter was following hypocritically in Antioch. Obviously, nothing destroys unity in a community faster than refusing to eat together. And that is just common sense as well. Whether it's first century common sense or 21st century common sense. This is human nature, they say. Even among young children in school, you eat with, who you eat with during lunch indicates which community has accepted you. Right? You've got our little cliques in school. So for Jews and Gentiles in the early church, a failure to eat together struck at the heart of unity in the body. Secondly, Jewish observance of Sabbath and feasts and other elements of the law drove the wedge even deeper. Uh, they go on to say, this is not a great recipe 
for unity in the body, which is why Paul set out to address these issues in his letter. But at this point, we need to ask if these chapters are still relevant to our church today. First, there are some places where this problem still exists. For example, the church in present-day Israel still deals with some of these concerns. Uh, for these settings, Romans 14 through 15 are immediately applicable. And in other places, it's becoming more common to find Messianic congregations assembling. Right? I, I have to agree with that, of course. And the, these are, listen to this bullet point, this is interesting. These, speaking of the Messianic congregations, these are ostensibly Christian gatherings that have adopted a distinctly Jewish style of worship to appeal to Jewish believers. I take it by their inclusion of the word ostensibly, in case you can't remember what ostensibly means. Let me see if I can highlight it there. Okay, ostensibly means supposedly, right? Or um, uh, what people are saying it is. So these are supposedly Christian gatherings. I take it by their parenthesis there that they're not sure what to make of, of Messianic congregations. I, I haven't spoken with them, so I don't know. But um, they go on to say, but these groups, speaking of we Messianic groups, we these groups also attract Gentile believers who are attracted to understanding the Jewish roots of our faith. In these settings, you find the potential for the same conflict Paul was addressing in the early church. And finally, for the rest of the church, Paul's teaching remains relevant when considered in a more general way. Even if we aren't dealing with differences between Jew and Gentile, we are still we still contend with other differences, racial differences, nationality differences, cultural differences, believers with different convention, conviction, different levels of spiritual maturity, different interpretations of scripture. These differences could lead to similar division and difficulties, and therefore they can be resolved by applying the principles found in these chapters. So I think that's where I'll stop by reading verse by verse ministries.org. Uh, Again, I appreciate their ministry. Go to their website at www.versebyverseministries.org and avail yourself of all of their resources as I'm clicking on their homepage so you can see. Um, I, I appreciate their resources. Um, they build themselves as your number one source for free in-depth Bible teaching. And they've got a, a very nice put together website and a lot of good resources. Uh, it's just from a Messianic pro tour perspective, they're going to be outside of hitting the bullseye when it comes to my understanding of applicability of Torah for Gentile Christians and things like that. So that's why we read their commentary. I'm not trying to slam them. I'm not trying to look down on them. I'm just trying to show and demonstrate a traditional Christian perspective so that we can launch from that and build some different perspectives. And we'll look at those next week, okay? And in fact, next week, this is a sneak peek, we'll look at Paul's epistle to the Romans as put together by Tim Haig and begin to read through some of his notes. Tim Haig is a Messianic teacher, well-respected in the Messianic movement, and one of the more solidly grounded theologians when it comes to uh, getting inside the mind of Paul from a, from a pro tour perspective. So we'll start by looking at his commentary next week, okay? Thank you.